Thank you, Sister Melling, and uh, good morning uh, to one and all. Last month, a lorry driver from Sri Aman in Sarawak won the lottery with a price of more than 9 million ringgit. I'm sure he was happy when he heard the news. Very happy. But his happiness is dependent on his circumstances. The word, uh, what is the difference between this happiness and the word blessed? Can I invite us to turn to the book of James in chapter 1 and we will look starting from verse 12 onwards. Book of James in chapter 1, verse 12. Reading from verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So the word blessed here, we see, is a different kind of happiness. It is a happiness that's not dependent on external circumstances. So James is writing to people who are under difficult circumstances. James is writing to Jewish Christians who were scattered in different places because of persecution. And so this, this, James wants to encourage them to stay holy and godly despite the difficult situation. And he says that they are blessed. As Christians, we are blessed. We have received the forgiveness of our sins. We have uh, our needs provided for. And verse 12 says, in future we will receive the crown of life. So temptation, uh, verse 12 additionally says that blessed is the man who remains steadfast under temptation. So that means that to remain steadfast, to not come under the temptation. But the, the word means to endure and to persevere. Right? The Greek grammar says to keep on persevering. Right? Temptation is the enticement to commit sin. T temptation is not a sin. Jesus was tempted by the devil, but he did not give in to temptation. What if we fall into temptation? Let us look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we fall into temptation, we should confess and repent and then we keep on persevering again. This is, if we fall into temptation, this is what we must do. If we fall into temptation, we must not do verse 13 of James chapter 1, verse 13, which says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. I don't want to steal, but God put this in front of me. What am I trying to say here? I'm not taking responsibility for my sin, but I want to blame it on someone or something. And when people sin, no, usually they will want to blame it on their family, their friends, their country, and frequently blame it on God. And so they will say that, I can't help it because that's the way that God made me. And so I'm not responsible. It's God's fault. But James, verse, in verse 13, says, God is not the one who tempt us for two reasons. First, God cannot be tempted to do evil, so God does not do evil. Second, God does not tempt people to do evil. So if we are tempted to do evil, it is not from God. So we should not blame God. But blaming God is like in our DNA. It happens right at the beginning of time in, in the Garden of Eden with the first man and the first woman. Let, let us go back there in Genesis chapter 3, uh, at a time when Adam rebelled against God, went against God's command, and then in Genesis chapter 3, God confronted Adam, and we will be looking at verse 11b. And God speaking to Adam, 
Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Adam did not admit responsibility. Verse 12, he mentioned the woman. But he's not blaming the woman directly. He is saying, the woman whom you gave. He's blaming God. He's saying that before you gave me the woman, everything was fine. Then one day, I fell asleep and when I woke up, I was married. And from that time on, everything went downhill. And what about the woman? And we will pick that up in verse 13. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. The woman also did not accept responsibility. She put the blame on the serpent, the devil. But indirectly, she is blaming God. Because why is there a serpent in the Garden of Eden? God must have allowed it. So it's God's fault. Both Adam and Eve blame God for their sin. And guess what? We came from them. But verse 13 of uh, James chapter 1 says that God is not the one who tempted us. So who tempted us? Let's go to verse 14 of James chapter 1. Verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So the serpent, the devil, seeks to tempt us. He is the enemy on the outside. But verse 14 says, we have an enemy on the inside. It's called his own desire. This is our desire. But it is corrupted and perverted by our sinful nature to become sinful desires. So with this sinful desire, do you think we can live a sinless life? Say, by moving to live on top of the mountain by ourselves? You just have to think of the example of this group of people who decided not to get married and just stay with their own people in a place far away and every day they just pray, read the Bible and do ministry. You just have to read the news to know what happens. There are reports of Roman Catholic priests and monks, some living in monasteries, reported to commit child sexual abuse. You cannot run away from sin by changing your environment because wherever you go, you bring yourself with you. So verse 14 shows us that temptation, falling in temptation is a two-stage process. You can see that first, he is lured, and second, he is enticed. The first stage is that we are lured out. That is the metaphor from the world of hunting and fishing. So the animal hiding in the jungle is safe. The fish hiding under the rocks is safe. When we remain in our zone of safety, we are safe. But the fish sees the bait and is lured to come out of the safety of the rocks. And we see the bait and we think it is something that it will satisfy us and if, if we miss it, it will be not good for us. And so we come out, we leave our zone of self-restraint that's being lured. The second stage is to be enticed or enchanted. So the fish thought it's going to get a meal, but it ended up being hooked and dragged away. It becomes somebody's meal. Our sinful desire liked what we hear and see and we are enticed. We are dragged away to destruction. Two stage, lured and enticed. I once saw a woman who was seeking to buy a piano for children and so she set the price limit uh, for that piano. And the piano salesman asked her, do you play? She says, yes. Salesman says, please play. And so the salesman listened to her playing and then the salesman said to her, you play very well. You deserve a much better piano. What was he saying? He was using flattering words to lure her out of a safety zone so that she can be enticed to buy a more expensive 
piano. One of the most important principles of warfare is to know your enemy. And for Christians, traditionally, we are told that we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So the world is the world system, the beliefs and values of this world system. And Jesus says we are to be in the world, but not of the world. We do not share in the values of this world. Second enemy is the devil. The devil is the ruler of this world. The devil has been called the father of lies. Behind every temptation, the devil would say that God does not have your best interests at heart. The sin is for your benefit. So how does the world, the flesh, help to work together uh, to tempt our flesh? Let me suggest two examples. The first example is I know someone who needed money to buy something and heard of a good offer. The offer is something like this. If you give me 10 ringgit and wait for a while, I will give you back not 10 ringgit, but 30 ringgit. Sounds good. The more you put in, the more you receive. And so that, that, that really strikes uh, his in, uh, the person's interest. And so how does the world, the flesh, and the devil work in this situation? He was think, the person was thinking that the, the person does not have that much money to put in. So the only way to have more money is to borrow. But normally borrowing from the bank is not exciting because you have to pay back with interest. But in this case, it's very exciting because whatever you borrow is going to be multiplied and then when you give back to the bank, you still have plenty left over. So the person uh, uh, was tempted in this way. How does the world, the flesh and the devil work? It could be like this. The world says, this is a great offer. You can get rich quick without working, without doing any work. So hurry up, take the loan, take the offer. The flesh says, this thing that you're going to buy will make you very happy. The world says, you deserve to own that thing. You are not rich like him. You don't have high income like her. God is not taking care of you. You have to take care of yourself. So hurry up, take the loan and join the offer. And so that's what happened. At first, there's dividend coming in. After a while, it stopped. But they said, it's all right because what we put in is still there. At most, we go back to square one. But no, even what was put in there was gone. So not only did the person not become richer, but he became a debtor to the bank. So the world, the flesh and the devil work together. Second example. I know a lady from the time I was in youth fellowship in secondary school. Some years ago, I, re I received a telephone call from her. At that time, we already finished school for a few years. I heard about this lady that she has been thinking of marrying a non-Christian man. She knows that Christians are not to marry non-Christians. But she called us, she called me to want to us to validate her decision. How did the world of flesh and the devil influence her decision? It could be something like this. The world says marriage is a personal choice. You can choose anyone that will make you happy. The flesh says, I'm attracted to this man. The devil says, you already waited until most of your friends are already married. If you wait longer, nobody will want you anymore. So all your church people also wouldn't want that to happen to you. So hurry up and grab the chance. So you see, the world and the devil every day is, can use the same way to tempt our sinful nature. What happens if we give in to temptation? Let's look at verse 15 of James chapter 1, verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. If we desire that which is against God's laws, then we are bringing forth, we are giving birth to sin or rebellion against God. 
And if we give birth to sin, then we also produce the, the, the uh, consequence of sin, which is judgment and death. And this is actually a universal experience, as we can see in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Moving to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. You can see here, one man, that's Adam. Adam was the representative of the human race. When Adam sinned, death came into the human race. And it's the same with us. When we sin, we die. This is bad news. Is the Bible just bad news? Is there a better way? Yes, there is. And the first step is the next verse in James 1, 16. James chapter 1, verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. James is calling to his beloved fellow Christians and calling to us, do not keep on being deceived about the nature of God. In verse 17, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God gives good and perfect gifts. God does not give evil. God does not give temptation. God only gives good gifts. And the Greek word for gift here uh, is a word that means a gift that's given freely. And the phrase coming down, coming down is in the Greek present tense, which means continually coming down. So God keeps on giving freely without cost good and perfect gifts. If God can become evil, we will be in big trouble. But no, God does not change. God cannot be bribed. God cannot be made to change. And God, the verse says, is the father of lights. God created the sun. But God is very different from the sun. From the earth, we can see the sun moving across the sky, becoming darker and brighter and darker and the shadow goes from small to long. But with God, there is no variation. With God, there is no shadow of turning. God is not unpredictable. God always gives good and perfect gifts. Have you ever received a gift at the lucky draw? If you did not receive a gift at the beginning of the draw, do you wait until the end of the draw to hope to receive the biggest gift? What is the best gift you ever received? The best gift that God has ever given to us is described in verse 18. Verse 18. Of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. This unchanging God made a decision. The decision is to bring us forth. This decision is on it, of his own will. It's not under compulsion. He didn't have to. We didn't deserve it. He decided to bring us forth or to give birth to us or to give, bring us into spiritual life. And he did that by the word of truth. Word here indicates preaching. He did it by the preaching of the gospel. That we should be first fruits. What is first fruits? the Jewish readers of this letter will know immediately because Jewish farmers give the first part of their harvest as the offering to God in anticipation of the rest of the harvest to come. So James is saying these early Christian believers is the first fruits. They will be followed by a big spiritual harvest to come. You and I are part of this later spiritual harvest and we join this harvest by responding to the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is what God has done through Jesus' life, death, and rising again. When did the gospel begin? The gospel began right at the time when men and women rebelled against God. Let us go back to Genesis chapter 3, and this time we'll pick it up from verse 
13, where we saw that woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And now God speaks to the serpent. The Lord God, verse 14, said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock. So God cursed serpent. God cursed the devil. And in verse 15, God speaks to the devil. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That was the beginning of the gospel. God has declared there is coming a day when the woman will have an offspring and the offspring of the woman will bruise the devil's head. That is, will defeat the devil. But in the process, he, his heel will be bruised. He will be wounded. 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the sinless Son of God, was born of a woman. Jesus was the offspring of the woman. And Jesus was sinless, but he carried our sins. So he was wounded when he died as the punishment for our sins. As explained in Romans chapter 6, let us move to Romans chapter 6 in verse 10. Romans 6 verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. The death that Jesus died is not because of his sins. He had no sin. He died for our sins. If we rely on Jesus, then he's already, his death was for our behalf. It means we are already dead. So being dead, therefore we have served the punishment for our crime. Sin has no more any claim on us. Last week, the president of the Malaysian Employer Federation said that if employers face a manpower shortage, they should hire ex-prisoners. What is ex-prisoners? Ex-prisoners are the people who served the sentence in prison and now they are free to go. They are free to go. If the prison guard were to say, come back, they can say, no, I already served my sentence. Yes, of course, they can go back on their own will, but nobody will do that because they are already free to go. That is what Paul was saying in Romans chapter 6, in verse 11 and 12. 6 verse 11 and 12. So we can see here that Paul is, is saying, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. When we became Christians, Jesus died on our behalf. And so we are already served the sentence for our sin. That means that we can say no to sin because sin no longer has a claim on us. That is why Paul says in verse 11, you must consider yourself dead to sin. That means you must keep in mind what has happened to you. And so verse 11, verse 12, Paul is saying, you must live in a way that's consistent with what happened to you. We can now say no to sin. So therefore, verse 12 says, let not sin reign in your body. If you let sin reign and control your body, then it is like you're going back to prison. Why would anyone want to go back to prison? Through Jesus, the penalty of our sin is paid. The power of sin is broken. And in future, we will have life after death. Jesus defeated the devil. Jesus bruised the serpent's head. Through Jesus, sin and death has been conquered. The Christian life is a life of power and joy. Yes, sometimes the temptation is very fierce and we have to endure under it. But Christian life is not a series of misery and self-denial. The Christian life essentially is a life of power and joy. It is power because we can say no to sin and yes to God. It is joy because as we saw in the beginning in verse 12 of James chapter 1, 
that blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. We are blessed because our happiness is not dependent on circumstances like winning a lottery. Happy is the man, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under temptation because he can see what's happening on the other side of the temptation. In the ancient Olympic Games, the winner does not get a medal. The winner gets an olive wreath. It's like the, the, uh, crown, it's like the crown of leaves that you saw just now, but except with no flowers, right? Uh, that is given at the end of the race. The prize that we are aiming for is not a physical crown. But verse 12 says the prize we're aiming for is the crown of life. Life? We have life now? But no, the life that we have now is subject to death. And the life that's being given to us is not called life. It is described as crown. That means that it is life of a far higher quality than life we have here. It is life that is eternal. It is life that is supernatural. But we are on earth. We are often tempted by the temporal things of this earth. I gave two examples. Money and marriage. These are good gifts from God. But we love God. We love the giver more than the gift. Yes, we want money, but not at any means. Yes, we want marriage, but not at any cost. We endure through temptation. And we know that soon the race will be over. And verse 12, and verse 12 says, God has promised something for us. Meantime, the way to overcome temptation is to keep our eyes on the crown, the eternal crown. Because in heaven, we don't need money. In heaven, there is no marriage. But in heaven, there is given to us a crown of life, which will be a gift that's greater than any gift we have ever received on this earth. And verse 12 says, God promised to give it to those who love him. God always gives good gifts. God never changes his mind. The unchanging God says to us this morning that if we endure under temptation and love him, he will give us the crown of life. We're going to pause for a few moments before I close in prayer. If you're struggling with temptation, spend a few moments to claim God's promise and say no to sin, say no to the devil and the world. If you have never responded to the gospel before, ask God, tell God that you trust Jesus for his death to pay your penalty of sin and tell Jesus you want to live for him. Shall we spend a few moments to pray? After a while, I will close in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we leave our prayers before you. But we have heard your word and thank you that you are good God, that you always give good gifts and that you, all, you never change. And we thank you for your precious promises that when we endure through the difficulties of this life, we await when the race is over, the eternal crown of life. We pray for each one in living hope, each one hearing this, that you grant them faith that they will come to Jesus and they will obtain from him by faith the penalty of sin being paid, the ability and the right to say no to sin and to live a life pleasing to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.